Yo, what's going on, everybody? How we doing tonight? A little something. Hey, just like ahead of time, if my voice seems a little bit off, it's because I was at Wildfire and it was awesome. Who else was at Wildfire? Anybody else? Yeah. Yo, for real though, we need to like praise those people. One of my learnings from Wildfire every year is that middle schoolers are straight animals, especially at mealtimes. And so many of you are on Kitchen Crew. I think I literally just got an amen. Here we go. Yo, for real though, um, uh, this year at Wildfire, I, I think the number was 87 middle schoolers decided to follow Jesus for the first time. So yeah, clap it up for that. And, uh, and the work that y'all do, y'all high schoolers that served at Wildfire, is not insignificant at all. All of that goes exactly towards um, just that, students coming to know Jesus and then fully following him more. Um, and there's nothing more important than that. Lastly, real quick, uh, the same thing that makes Wildfire awesome is the exact same thing that makes Fall Retreat awesome. Uh, tonight is the early bird deadline. This is just me reminding you again to get the cheapest price, make sure that you register tonight and all that stuff is online. So um, as we jump in, again, this is kind of like a, a, a one night talk specifically about heaven. But as we get started, the, the question that I have for you is, uh, do you ever learn a piece of information or find something out and it just completely shifted your perspective and then changed your actions moving forward? I want you to think about that. Something that was right in front of your face, uh, maybe you just got a little bit of a fact or a little bit of a perspective change and then all of a sudden you can't look at that thing the same and it changes your actions moving forward. Let me give you just a couple of examples. One, uh, for the longest time, I was a, a loyal Android phone user. Anybody else, loyal Android phone users? Literally three of you, really great, cool, cool, cool. So my wife was like, hey, you need to switch over, like our iPhones will work better together, so I, I ended up doing that. But here's the thing, uh, the first while that I had an iPhone, it was not like an Android, and I found that out really early because on an Android, the way that you silence it is you just keep pushing the down button. It's fairly simple. Then I got my iPhone and I tried to silence it the same way. And I would like go down button, down button, down button, but it wouldn't silence. It would just keep ringing. I was like, this thing's broken. Like I'm all about Android and I get my first iPhone and it doesn't even work, right? So literally the first several weeks, I'm trying to silence my phone that way. Um, I'm running a meeting like in Collide over the weekend and it rings and I was like, guys, I just need to be honest with you. I just got this iPhone, it's broken. Can somebody help me like figure this out? And there was a, a freshman in college, she was a girl like, like up front and she started to smile like I was making a joke. And then she realized I was serious and she was like, aww. <laughs> so she grabs my phone, she turns it to the side and all of a sudden shows me this little switch that will actually silence your phone. Boom, perspective change. You guys are like, wow, he really didn't know that. I really didn't know that, it was weeks. It was weeks that I existed. I could have Googled it, but I didn't. I don't know. I don't know. So uh, that was one. Second thing, okay? Um, let's see. Probably eight months ago, uh, Jade and I, as my wife, decided to go like two feet in on being a minivan family. Anybody else got minivans in their family? Okay, you're rolling around in a minivan? Okay. Just got like the dad wagon, right? And it is fully a dad wagon. So we're driving around in that. And... Um, the thing that that changed for us pretty significantly was that both of our vehicles all of a sudden had gas tanks on opposite sides, right? So I would roll into the gas station and I would never remember which side my gas tank was on and I'd always go to the wrong side and I need to do some kind of like background business to like actually get it lined up and I'd waste all this time and I was super frustrated. All of a sudden one night I'm on YouTube and you know, like as it happens, you get like 10 related videos down. You're like, how did I even get here? It was one of those. It was like a 50 minute video on life hacks. And I'm like 25 minutes in wondering why I'm doing this in the first place. And all of a sudden I found out some of you that like this is gonna help for real, for real, okay? On your gas gauge, there is an arrow that points to the gas tank. Raise your hand if you didn't know that. It's embarrassing, but now you do, now you do, okay? There is an arrow on your gas gauge that will actually point to the gas tank. Fact, perspective change, and I've been good ever since. Last one, and this one's really important to me. This one's probably changed my behaviors the most. Um, how many of you, when you're cooking for yourself, use the microwave a whole lot? A whole, whole lot, okay? You're like, literally my diet's Hot Pockets, that's all I do. Okay, uh, so I use the microwave a lot too. And all of a sudden I had this epiphany, right? So I'm just like, usually I just go like add 30 seconds, add 30 seconds and I just do that until whatever I'm doing is cooking. I don't even like do time cook. It's just, it's just that one button. All of a sudden it's like, you know what? I'm gonna expand my world today. I'm gonna look at the options. Yo, 
There was a potato button on the microwave. Raise your hand if you knew. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I, and Joe and Caroline know because they make fun of me for this. I've been eating a whole lot of potatoes lately. As a side to your lunch now, what I do, I just get a potato. You just stab it a couple times. You must stab it or it will explode. I'm not, it's not personal experience, but it will explode on you. You stab it a couple times, throw it in there, potato button, and basically you got a big old French fry that you can dip in ketchup. That's a fact. Someone's going to use that. That's going to change your lunching. Thank you. That deserves to be clapped for, right? But we're just having a little bit of fun, right? Obviously, none of those things are big. None of those, they did change my actions. I wasn't lying to you, but at the end of the day, uh, none of those things are a big deal. However, we do believe that there is something that if you see it correctly, if you see it uh, the way that God wants you to see it, it will change your actions today. It'll change your life today. And we believe that that is heaven, and that's exactly what we want to talk about tonight. So, so often, what we have a tendency to do is to kind of format our understanding of heaven more off of like Hollywood than the actual Bible. And some of y'all, when you think about heaven, you're like, yeah, so it's like they're really chubby baby things with wings playing the harp kind of a deal. And it's just like, it's just worship music all the time, right? Like that's basically what we do in heaven. Uh, we want to start to reformat some of that and actually try and take as biblical a perspective as we can, start to build in some base layers of how we're understanding heaven and then what that means for us right now. So uh, get your phones out. We are going to flip to Revelation chapter 21, and I'm going to send you to uh, verses 1 through 7. So it'll be just at the beginning of Revelation chapter 21. I got to tell you this mini wildfire story as you're getting there. Um, at Wildfire, we do time with God with, with middle schoolers to teach them how to read their Bibles, to teach them how to pray. And my favorite, my favorite thing, maybe all camp, was I overheard, I, I, I overheard these three middle schoolers. They had to be fifth graders. Um, they were like jogging to their cabin, and the one was like, dude. I was reading Revelation this morning, and they took, like, the fifth angel, and they just threw everybody in the abyss, and it was awesome. And he was just, like, elated. It was so funny. He was all about it. I'm pretty sure he's still reading his Bible today, which I'm excited about, too. It might just be Revelation, but still, it's cool. Um, again, chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 7, and we'll jump in. Y'all ready? ready? Here we go. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. What I want to do is just take out three lines from this very rich passage that we could pull all kinds of stuff out, uh, just three lines as we start to kind of build the foundation of how we understand heaven and what it means for us today. The first one's in verse three, and it simply says, God's home is now among his people. God's home is now among his people. And to truly understand the significance of this, what we need to be able to do is kind of take a broader scope to what's really happening throughout the whole biblical narrative. So if we start from the beginning, we have this all-powerful creative God that creates all these things, and he creates humanity in his image as his keystone creation, and he creates us with the express purpose to be in relationship with him and to represent him to all that he's created. And you guys know, it doesn't take long as you, as, as you jump into the Bible to see that that gets messed up. It's this thing called sin, and it screws up our relationship with God, and it screws up all the relationships on earth. And there was one fix to that, and Jesus came, and he died, and he rose to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be made right with him. And where we stand right now in like this, this grand story of redemption that God is writing with all that he's created is we can have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and he's changing us from the inside out. And because of what Jesus did, we can have right relationship with him, and it's this great thing. But simultaneously, there's this other tension where we're still fallen, we're still sinful, we're still jacked up, we're not perfected yet. The world that we live in is still jacked up, it's still fallen, it's still depraved. And both of these tensions are happening. And one of the first things that you need to understand about heaven 
is that God comes and makes his home among his people, and that is when he will completely redeem all things. All of a sudden, there won't be sin anymore. There, 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 there won't be um, that sinful nature in all of us. Our, our world won't be sinful the way that it is now. All of a sudden, we'll once again, just as we were created to have, have perfect relationship with God and perfect relationships with each other. God's home is now among his people. Finally, we'll get to exist within our purpose, within what God created us to. Two, and this is in verse four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no death or sorrow or crying or pain. Just want you to think about that for a moment. Like let that sink in. Just how much crap happens in our world today and what it would look like without all of that. Like it takes you a while to think about it. It's almost like um, if you asked a fish what water was like and I'm like, I don't know. Like it's literally, it's, it's just what I know. It's my experience, but we know that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be sickness or anxiety or depression or addiction or cancer or death or physical pain or emotional pain or relational stress from trying to like patch up relationships. It's just going to be perfection. It's going to be exactly what God intended us to be. And sometimes like we can stretch our minds just a little bit to try and start to think about what our existence would be like without those things. But I want to press in just a little bit more because that's not it. I want you to think about what your existence would be like if, if you didn't even have like the normal aches and pains just of being human, just of having gravity weighing on you all the time, just if you could wake up and you didn't need to constantly think about um, your image and how other people are thinking about you because your identity is so locked up in Christ that you don't even have to think about it. What if you didn't need to wake up and think about um, different like relational tensions, whether it's family stuff or friend stuff, it's not even a thought in your mind. You don't even get stress about it. It's just, it's, it's, it's not even on the radar. Literally, you wake up and you get to worship God and be in perfect relationship with him and have perfect relationships with other people and do all that God created you for. That's heaven. And it's one of those things that like, yeah, we can talk about it, but I'm convinced that we'll never fully understand until we're there. Again, because we're just so... Um, in it, where it's all around us. It's so hard to separate those things. So in heaven, we'll have perfect relationship with God. We'll have perfect relationships with each other. There's not going to be any pain. There's not going to be any death or crying. Three, and this is in verse six, as we keep going. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely. This is a really important point, and it's important to know that heaven is available to everyone. A relationship with Jesus is available to everyone. And one of the things that I want to blow up a little bit, that in my opinion, is one of the biggest misconceptions about life after death. So many people approach that with thinking like, well, like, I'm basically a good person, right? Like, I can think of people that are worse than me. Hitler was kind of the worst. Like, I'm better than that. Like, come on now, right? Like, I'll make it to heaven. And they have this perception in their minds of getting at the end of time and meeting God and as, as if he's going to put up like this cosmic scoreboard with all of the good things that I did and all the bad things that I did. And as, as long as there's more good things than bad things, like I'll make it, right? Like that's how it works. Please, please, please hear me tonight. That's not at all how it works. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You cannot earn your way to a relationship with God. It is 100% based off of what Jesus did for us. And again, the sin, sin got in the way of our perfect relationship with God and the only remedy to sin, we are hopeless and helpless in and of ourselves. It's because Jesus died, rose again, paying the, 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 the debt that we had accrued through our sin so that we can have that relationship again. It is 100% believing and following Christ. It is 100% based off of our relationship with Christ. That is how you get to heaven. Number three. Um, so I know you're thinking like, hey, so yeah, pretty, pretty foundational stuff, pretty basic stuff, all that's good. But what does that mean for right now? What does that mean for me today? How does that affect anything within my life right now? Because frankly, that seems really far off. Like I don't even really need to worry about it right now. And what I want to have you turn to um, is Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. Please turn there because it's going to be a verse uh, that you'll want to highlight or bookmark again. That is Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. You can go there on your phone. I'll give you just a couple more seconds. 
Again, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and we'll jump in. What does this mean for us now? What does this mean for us today? But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Yo, you need to hear tonight that if you're following Jesus and you have a relationship with him, you are a citizen of heaven. And I don't know if you caught it in the passage there. That wasn't like future tense. You will be a citizen of heaven. That is right now. You are a citizen of heaven. You are not ultimately defined by your role here on earth. The Bible in, in another passage refers to our time here on earth as a mist. In the grand span of eternity, your identity is locked up in heaven if you are following Jesus. It's not right now. So just to like jump in on that a little bit further, just to explain that a little bit more. Um, uh, Y'all know that I grew up in a ministry family. My, my dad was a pastor for a while, but before that he was a missionary. Um, and that's something that you just kind of end up doing all together because you're going to different places and whatever. And um, there was one mission trip in particular that we were going to Oaxaca, Mexico, and it was kind of a, a longer term thing. It wasn't like a week long thing that, that we would do like here. Um, but we were there for several months. And uh, so we get to this place and it is nothing like the U.S. And our times there, let's see, I was probably like eight or nine years old. I have two older brothers that are two and four years older than me. So it's kind of like a formative age. It's kind of a weird age. Uh, to do that much change. And I remember getting there and just being shocked, even like beyond just that they don't speak the same language, but all the cultural things that were completely different that we had to get used to. And um, things like um, don't go outside the, like the, the missionary compound because bad things happen out there. Again, this is being explained to like an eight or nine year old. It's like, okay, it's like I'll stay in here, that's fine. Um, or finding out that like you can't just go to the faucet and get a drink, like all that needs to be boiled before or you will get very sick. Or the biggest one for me, was learning that there's like, and again, it's like a warm climate kind of place, which means there's all kinds of crazy critters over there, like big old snakes and tarantulas and scorpions. And the scorpions are what got me at eight or nine years old because they were like, hey, these are fairly common. And if they get in your house, what'll happen? They really like to jump into shoes. And I was like, you're not kidding me, right? Like what? So they jump in your shoes. They're like, hey, every time that you put on your shoes, what you need to do is like pound the bottom of it to make sure that it gets out so that you don't put your shoe in or put your foot in and then get stung by a scorpion. And I was unprepared for this at eight or nine years old. It's like, are you kidding me right now? There's gonna be monsters crawling in my shoes. I wanna go home, right? And it was like all these things where it's like, I'm just not used to this. This isn't what I want. I'm very uncomfortable. My family's not here. My friends aren't here. Like, for lack of a better way of saying, this sucks. And I can remember one of the constant refrains that our parents talked us through while we were in that age, just, hey, remember, this isn't home. You can do anything for just a little bit of time. This place doesn't define you. This place really isn't the point. We're here for a really good purpose, and we're going to do what we're doing here, but then we're going to go home where you're meant to be. Don't get your mind too locked up in here. We're only going to be here a couple months. You could do anything for just a little bit longer. And just like my parents told me in that moment, just like Paul told the Philippians, is God telling you, I don't know what your circumstances are tonight. I don't know what's weighing down on you. I don't know what you're navigating, but you might just need to hear God saying to you, you're not home. And you really can't get too comfortable here. You weren't made for this. Your identity is locked up in Christ in heaven. The point's not here. This is just a mist. You are a citizen of heaven. You are a child of the king. And that's a kingdom that will be established in just a little bit longer. So what does that mean for now? What does that mean for today? Man, I don't know what you're going through. Maybe, maybe it's a uh, loved one passed away right? And it sucks and you miss them. I get all that. We deal with this, with these two realities. There's an earthly reality that's happening right now that we're experiencing currently. And there's an eternal reality that primarily defines us. So yes, right here, right now, it sucks. I get it. The eternal reality, if they're following Jesus, they just beat you home. You'll get to say hi in a little bit. 
they're just finishing their heaven tour before you get there, and then you'll get to hang out again. It's cool. It's these dual realities, and it's really hard to bring together sometimes. Two, maybe you're dealing with a diagnosis, or you have someone that's close to you that's dealing with a diagnosis, and they feel weak, and they feel tired, and they feel sick. You need to remember that that weakness is the perfect stage for God to show his strength. It says over and over and over in scripture that it's our weakness, that that'll be most clearly communicated. And every tinge of weakness that you feel, every tinge of sickness that you feel, every time that drags down on you is just a reminder to submit to God who never gets tired, weak, or sick. And he'll be your strength. Maybe you're struggling with a secret sin and you're tired of fighting it and you're tired of struggling with it and it's just annoying. You got this sinful nature and you just want to submit to it and just let it be. No, keep fighting because every win in that fight is just a glimpse of glory that God will reveal and completely redeem at the end of time. And every loss in that fight is just a reminder that you need to go right back to your gracious father who is waiting to hug you and help you fight from the inside out. You are not in that fight alone. It's not just your sinful nature inside of you. It is the Holy Spirit, and he's stronger than anything that you're fighting right now. It's part of the tough part about being a Christian right now. It's dual realities, this one that we live in now and this eternal one where our identity is. So my question for you, as you're processing this, as you're thinking it through, as you're not just learning about heaven, but you're understanding what that means for us right now, what do you need to hear from God? Some hope tonight. Maybe you need to know that in the midst of your circumstances, it sucks not because God's there, but because he's not done with it yet. I promise you, he's not done with it yet. You aren't home. Don't get too comfortable. Allow the pain and the discomfort and whatever's weighing down on you to push you right back to your heavenly father and he will sustain you and continue to change you from the inside out in ways that you can't even anticipate. That's why we have weakness to push us back to God, okay? So what is it for you? Where's God working in your life right now? What do you need to submit to him? I'm gonna pray and then we'll, we'll head out to life groups. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we just want to come to you humbly with our weaknesses, with our burdens, with our hang-ups, with our struggles. Lord, you know all of it. Father, please allow our weakness to just draw us to you, to push us to you, who will give us strength. Father, please give us strength. Please keep changing us from the inside out by your spirit. Please help us to rely on you. Please help us not to run from our human frailty, but just to have it push us to you all the more. We love you, Father. We need you, Father. Please continue to work in us. Please give us hope. Please give us perspective. And in that moment where we have two eyes in our immediate circumstances, please remind us to shift our gaze up, to see that eternal reality, to see that we're citizens of heaven and that we're child, children of the king. We need you, Father, and we love you. We're gonna lift up tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Amen.